Welcome Newtown Road family, friends, neighbors, guests, or maybe you just accidentally scrolled down and found our Facebook feed and you decided to join us this morning. I want to say welcome to you. My name is Tyler. I'm the Youth and Families Pastor here at Newtown Road. And we are so glad that you've decided to join us this morning for our worship service. Uh, And we hope that it can be an encouragement to you and your family as we go through these times, these crazy times. Uh, And as much as we wish we were together, uh, we're blessed and appreciative that we have the opportunity to worship together uh, via live stream like this. So whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, we want to say thanks for joining us and welcome. And if you can do us a favor and just let us know that you're here by going to the comments and letting us know, or even better, you can fill out a communication card that should be linked in our comments. Um, And if you can let us know you're here by filling that out, it would be an amazing thing. Uh, Whether it's your first time, and you're a guest, or whether you've been at our church for years and years, we'd love to know that you are here and that you're engaging with with, uh, our church service this morning. And so we appreciate that. Uh, And now I've got a couple quick announcements and things happening. And the first is this. Tonight, for grades 6 to 12, we have our Zooth group that happens every Sunday night, uh, and that's at 6 o'clock. And so if you can join us tonight at 6 o'clock, for Zooth Group. Uh, It'll be a fun time. And if you don't have that link and need it, email tyler at newtownroad.org and I would gladly send you that link before tonight. And then uh, even more importantly is next week's Zooth Group because next week is a huge night and it's called Varsity Night. And Varsity Night's one of our favorite nights because our high school students are planning and executing the entire night. And so You don't want to miss it. They're running the games, they're doing the teachings, they're running the small groups, and they are coming up with all of it on their own. And so we want you to be a part of it. If you are in grades 6 to 12 or have friends that are in those grades, uh, we would love for you to invite them to come and join you for Varsity Night Zoot Group next Sunday night. And, you know, right now we are missing you guys. We miss meeting together. And I know Miss Heather... In talking with her and Miss Jess and talking with her, uh, we miss the families of our church and they're doing everything that they can to help you stay engaged with what's happening. And so if you haven't already subscribed to our Newtown Kids YouTube channel, we would love for you to do that. Uh, Miss Heather puts out a video on Sunday mornings that helps you stay connected with the Gospel Project and our curriculum and what's happening at our church. And so uh, if you haven't watched the video this morning, I would encourage you to go and do that. And then also, Miss Heather did an amazing thing this week, and she decided that she missed you so much that she was going to write down the kids in our ministry by name, pray for them on our church parking lot with a Bible verse underneath. And so if you haven't driven out to the church parking lot and searched for the name of your child and the verse underneath that, we would, I would encourage you to do that. We would love for you to do that. And we want to say thank you to Miss Heather for taking the time to do that, for loving on our kids and our ministry, um, because I know our boys enjoyed that and appreciated that. Uh, And then a couple other quick announcements. We want to say thank you for being so generous in your giving, uh, especially to the partners of our church and the organizations that are doing great work right now uh, during this pandemic. And so if you are um, or are interested in giving to the food pantries in the capital region, we've got a bin right outside the office building at our church. You can come bring your food items put it in that bin, and we will distribute those. And I know the organizations that we've already helped have been so appreciative of what you have done to to serve them and be good neighbors during this time. And then for our church, I, I feel like I say it every week, but thank you so much for being faithful with your tithes and your offerings um, and giving out of the abundance of your heart. And what Christ has given to us has been a blessing to our church. You're doing an amazing job. We want to say thank you. And until we see you in person, be blessed. We're praying for you. We love you. I'm going to pass it over to Pastor Matt. We hope you're encouraged this morning. Thank you. 
Well, good morning, Newtown Road. It is so good to see you again today. Uh, thank you for joining in with us here uh, for another edition of our Sunday service brought to you uh, over the internet into your homes. Welcome to phase one. Apparently, this is what it feels like, and honestly, it feels like it had for the last 10 weeks. So, uh, some of you have been asking, what does that mean for us as we're starting into this uh, new phase of reopening here in upstate New York? And uh, the reality is that in this first phase, um, there's still not a lot of changes to our regular schedule. And so because of the guidelines and, su and the suggestions, because of the health and the safety of our congregation and the community, uh, we're not going to make a ton of changes right now to this current system. Um, hopefully once we enter into some of the next phases of reopening and we can see how this is playing out, uh, we'll have some, some more information for you. Our elders met for a a long time last week, uh, prayerfully considering ways that we could begin to reopen. Hopefully we'll have a plan in place that we can share with you in the coming weeks. But until then, enjoy this newfound freedom or whatever it might be and enjoy phase one. Um, but for, for now, just, just wanted to let you guys know that we're not going to make uh, many, many changes at all to our, our normal rhythm right now. Um, we'll continue to, to share our sermons online like this and uh, try to make ways for us to stay Stay connected. Um, we'll let you know as soon as we know uh, something as that changes. Also, I wanted to point out this morning that we are this weekend celebrating Memorial Day. Um, and, and I don't want to let the, the circumstances of the current health uh, crisis cloud our vision uh, about what this weekend is really about. Memorial Day is set aside not for barbecues, for yard work, and for lounging. But it's a sacred day where we pause to remember the heroic and the selfless men and women who laid down their lives to secure, to protect, and to preserve our national freedoms and our very way of life. It's an opportunity for us to reflect on the truth that freedom is never, in fact, free. That it always comes at a great cost, and the currency by which that cost is measured is blood. Let's not look past that this weekend. Of all people, Christians, we, we ought to be a people who possess a depth of understanding in this area. After all, our freedom came at the cost of the life of the Son of God. It was his death for our sin that released us and liberated us from the tyranny of the enemy's grip on our lives. So let us celebrate this weekend the freedoms we possess. And let us honor together well the memory and the legacy of those who secured those freedoms for us. And let's continue to pray for those uh, of our loved ones and our friends who are on the front lines uh, fighting to defend our national freedoms and our way of life. And we pray that God would continue to protect them and keep them safe. This morning we're back in, in Mark chapter 8. We are uh, continuing steadily along through our study in Mark's gospel. It has been such a joy to, to get through these first eight and a half chapters so far. And I hope it's been a blessing to you. We're back there at uh, Mark chapter 8. Starting in verse 22, we're going to read to, to verse 33 this morning. Here's what Mark tells us in chapter 8 verse 22. And they came to Bethsaida. And some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. 
For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. A brief word of prayer before we begin. Our Father, we thank you for the word of God, for its power in our lives, for the way that it exposes us and clarifies our, our understanding. We pray for your blessing on the teaching of the word today, that your spirit would move through the, the words of, of the Bible to soften our hearts, to open our eyes, to conform us to the image of Christ. We pray that you would give us understanding and some challenging truth. Lord, we pray for um, the opportunity this weekend as we remember and reflect upon those who died to secure our freedoms, we, we pray that we would honor their legacy well, that our minds would be drawn repeatedly to the sacrifice that it took. Lord, we pray for the families of those who have lost loved ones in conflict. And we pray for your comfort on them. We pray for the men and women in uniform still serving today, that you would be uh, a guard around them and a protection for them. And God, we ask that as we uh, ponder these things, that the greater themes of spiritual freedom and liberation from our enemy might also be present in our minds. We thank you for the gift it is to live in such a great country. And we pray for your blessing on our nation. And our blessing on our, your blessing on our time today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. A little bit of background information this morning before we jump in. Um, you remember, maybe you will remember, last week I mentioned that the passages from the past few Sundays are all intimately connected and are part of a larger explanation of some really important themes that Mark is trying to communicate. The miracles, the conversations, the rebukes, the explanations are all working together. And one of the great blessings of studying the Bible the way that we do is that we can't just drop in on a few verses and pull out when, and miss the bigger picture. So by way of review, here's what we've seen over the last couple weeks. Jesus feeds another crowd of people and is confronted by the Pharisees. He refuses to give them the sign that they're asking for. And in the boat with his disciples, it's revealed that these disciples, after all they've seen, still don't understand who Jesus is. It's also revealed that the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod, which really was the seeds of unbelief, is actually present in the disciples as well. And today we pick up in the telling of this part of Jesus' ministry. The first portion that we're going to look at is the, the healing in Bethsaida in verses 22 through 26. And the miracle here serves as an illustration of this main issue that Jesus is addressing. And namely, that the disciples... Uh, even the disciples need to be able to see clearly because what is abundantly clear from the last couple of weeks is that the disciples are not quite getting all that is being shared with them. In verse 22, we find that in the region of Bethsaida, there was a, a blind man that was brought to Jesus by some people. This they uh, came to Bethsaida and some people brought to him a blind man. Again, we have these anonymous friends who are bringing their friend to Jesus. And like we said last week, the vast majority of Christian work is carried out not by the superstars and the elite, but it's carried out by humble and anonymous servants who just die to themselves and live for Jesus. And that's what we have yet again. They bring their blind friend to Jesus. And Jesus, once again, takes the blind man away from the crowd. He pulls him out, uh, not to make a spectacle of him. He leads him by the hand out of the village. And he also, I think, pulls him aside because a healing like this might have been a little bit hard to interpret and understand. The crowd does not do a very good job um, identifying what Jesus is saying or who Jesus is. And this would have been confusing to them. And the truth is actually nobody really seems to be getting Jesus' message. He's as clear as he can be, and it seems like everybody's missing it. And the crowd is, is essentially there to get, they've gathered to, to see a good show. And the healing here is such an interesting thing. Th this healing for this blind man comes in two stages. In, in the first stage of the healing, Jesus actually spits on the man's eyes and lays his hands on him. So as, as we read that, we would think that if that's happening, if Jesus spits on his eyes and touches him, the healing should be complete, right? Wrong. That, that's not what happens at all. He asks the man, can you see anything? 
And all of a sudden, the blind, men, the blind man can see, but he can't see clearly. He sees people, he says, but they look like trees walking. Now, maybe he had been able to see before. Maybe, maybe his sight had been taken from him by an illness or an accident. Maybe he had just touched trees in his blindness and created an image in his mind of what they might appear to be. There's no need to get too picky on how the blind man knew what trees looked like. Also, he, he didn't. He was, comparing, he was comparing people to trees, so I, he doesn't know what they look like. The main and the plain thing is that he couldn't see clearly enough to distinguish between a person and a tree, even though Jesus had touched him. And that's the point. The most important thing to see there is he could see in part, but not clearly, even though Jesus had touched him. So he says, look, I see, I see, tree, see people, but they look like trees walking. And Jesus lays his hands on him again a second time. And now he can see everything clearly. And Jesus sends him home and he says to him, don't even go into the village. Why not? Why, why couldn't he go into the village? Well, just as the disciples didn't understand... It is more than possible that the man's presence in the city would bring more confusion than it would clarity. It, it should not escape our attention that over and over again throughout the Bible's teaching that one of the primary pictures that God gives us of a person coming to faith in Jesus is blindness being restored to sight. And you'll remember, in just in verse 18, while Jesus was in the boat with the disciples, he asked them, do you have eyes but you can't see? And that's exactly what's happening. They have eyes to see, but they're unable to get the picture. See, that's exactly what Jesus is, is driving at. That's exactly the point that Mark is pointing out. That's probably the most important thing for us to know today. That these disciples, they could see all the things Jesus was doing and they could hear all the words of Jesus' teaching and still their view of Jesus, their sense of understanding about who he really was, was fuzzy. It was unclear. It was indistinct. So at any rate, the blind man from Bethsaida goes home seeing that day, rejoicing in the healing touch of Jesus. And the disciples leave with Jesus and they move on to the next town. So we see the healing in Bethsaida. Now we see a bold proclamation. In verse 27, they have a conversation on the way to Caesarea Philippi. So they're walking along and Jesus takes the opportunity to engage his disciples in conversation. And he asks them, guys, what's the word on the street? Who do these people say that I am? You're out there on the front lines. You're moving among the crowds. You observe what I'm doing and you hear what I'm saying. Who do they say that I am? And you, you wonder in this moment. like After all that Jesus has done to reveal his identity. Guys, who do these people think that I am? And look at their answers. Some people said John the Baptist. That he was, he, Jesus was the reincarnated John the Baptist. Raised from the dead. Some say Elijah that they saw something in Jesus' ministry that made them think that this was the return of the great prophet Elijah coming as the forerunner of Messiah. And we know that that ministry was actually fulfilled in the ministry of John the Baptist. Still others said, you are one of the prophets. And it was interesting to think about the fact that when he asked what they said of him, the answers all had this theme of, of a, there was something different about Jesus. There was something connected to God. He, there was something in his ministry that convinced the crowds that Jesus had in some way come down from God to them. They still weren't clear on his identity, but they knew that something was different about him. Unclear, but they were, he was definitely, Jesus was definitely unlike anyone they had ever seen. In verse 29, okay, okay, enough about the crowds. Jesus turns straight to the disciples and tries to get to the heart of the matter here. You guys who are close to me, you guys who I chose to follow me, you've walked with me, you've heard me, you've seen all that I've done. Who do you say that I am? 
Not just the crowd, not these people who gather for the show, not the people who have, have critical, cynical views of me. No, my own disciples who I called out of the boats to come follow me. Who do you say that I am? And Peter pipes up. It's always Peter, isn't it? It's always Peter. And in this case, he gets it right. He's the first to speak and he speaks boldly. He says, you are the Christ. Now, now the Christ isn't, that's not like Jesus' last name. The Christ is a title, the anointed one. You are the Messiah. You're the promised one. You're the son of God. You're not just a prophet. You're the promised king of Israel, the one we've been waiting for. And Matthew's gospel tells this story, but provides a little bit of, of different detail. And the detail that Matthew's gospel provides explicitly in actual words, Mark's gospel provides with an illustration. And what Matthew tells us and what Mark illustrates to us is that the information that Peter has, that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed Messiah, the son of the living God, that that information is not something that Peter arrived at because he observed well what was happening in front of him. That was given to him, revealed to him, came to him from God the Father. That's what Matthew 16, 17 tells us. What a tremendous step forward we've taken, right? Well, almost. You would, you would think that if you just read that passage, and you didn't read the passage before about the blind man and the two stages of healing, and you didn't read the passage we're just about to read, you would think that, wow, Peter finally gets it. He understands that Jesus is the one, the Christ, the Son of God. I've entitled the, the third portion of this passage, uh, Not So Fast. <laughs> Not So Fast. Jesus speaks to them clearly and in plain terms. And what did he teach them? He, in verse 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. You see, his teaching didn't bring the kind of response that we would hope. It wasn't a very encouraging lesson that Jesus was teaching the disciples. He was letting them know that the Son of Man would have to suffer many things, that he would be rejected by the religious crowd, by the elders, by the chief priests, by the scribes, by the people who should know better. By the people he had come to. The people who should have been able to recognize him first. The people who knew the word of God. They should have seen him first. He was rejected by his own. Not only rejected, but he was killed by them and he would rise again. The fact, the fact that he tells them, and I don't, I don't know, maybe it doesn't strike you as, as clearly as it did to me. But the fact that he tells them here. That he's going to be killed and rise again. And they don't remember it when Jesus is taken into custody. Is evidence of the point that Mark is making. So they can see clearly. Right? Peter gets it. Well when Jesus gets a little more precise in explaining his ministry. Peter reveals that maybe he doesn't quite get it yet. Peter in verse 32 takes Jesus aside to rebuke him. <laughs> I don't I love this guy. He is, he, he has like one speed. Like full on, impulsive. Uh, I just love him. He, he reminds me of some people I know. Peter takes Jesus aside to rebuke him. He answered the last question correctly. And he thinks now that, now that because he passed that test, now he has the authority to school Jesus on his own ministry. He takes him aside to rebuke him. And Jesus turns the tables and rebukes Peter with those famous words. He says, get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking about the things of God. 
Your mind is not focused on heavenly things. You're not per- thinking about the grand purposes and the plan of God and the fulfillment of, of a ministry that predates creation. You're not thinking about the eternal wisdom of God himself being uh, brought to earth and played out right here. You're only thinking about the things of man. What you can see, what you can touch, what you can understand. He says, get behind me, Satan. Now, Peter's not Satan. And and I don't think at all Jesus is trying to tell us that Satan had somehow now entered into Peter to control him. But Peter's rebuke demonstrates the same strategy that the enemy tries to use. Remember when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness? He tries to pull him away from the Father's will. You see, Satan's strategy was to divert Jesus away from God's ordained path to glory, a path that ultimately found its fulfillment through suffering, not through avoiding it. And Peter attempts, Peter's attempts to rebuke Jesus, if they were allowed to find their fulfillment, would have moved Jesus away from God's will with tragic results. Because before the foundations of the world, it was the plan and the purpose of God to offer up his only son to die for the sins of the world. Peter's rebuke here is evidence that he sees trees walking, but he's not yet seeing the Christ clearly. What a challenge to us today, isn't it? Isn't it challenging to think that sometimes our reactions to the circumstances in our lives, sometimes the responses to confusion and frustration and disappointment, sometimes our good intentions and even our heart-wrenching prayers are actually not guided by God's ways but our own, are not driven by his plans and purposes but by our own conventional worldly wisdom? Sometimes I wonder what the effect would have been if God would have answered every one of my prayers yes. Or if he would only have moved in my life in ways that I perfectly and completely understood at the time. Only moved in ways that seemed best to me. If he would have yielded every time I looked at him and asked him, why are you doing that? Every time my mind was focused on the things of this world and on the things of man and not the things of God, I demonstrate to him that I am not much different than Peter. This coronavirus is a prime example, by the way. My plan and my purpose for this would have been for this whole quarantine to be over by week two and us to be back to normal by now. But God obviously had other plans. And actually, through this, through this season unbeknownst to me at the beginning, and much to my surprise, the church, our church family, is as strong as it's ever been. People are growing. God is providing. Our church is being built up. Our church is being unified, even in quarantine. You see, it's a challenge for us today because so often we demand that God move according to our plans And we struggle to see that our minds are not fixed on the things of God. All right. So what? What is the big deal? What does this mean? That's a great question. What am I to make of all of this? Again, this is the grand culmination of a larger section of scripture. And here are a couple things that I think we can see this morning. First, Jesus, through his miracles and his teaching, through his presence, is revealing his true identity. He is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. He is the Messiah that God promised through the prophets of the Old Testament. He has come to inaugurate a new kingdom because the time has been fulfilled. And in the wisdom of God, he saw fit to send Jesus to fulfill his mission to seek and to save the lost. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is not just a moral teacher. And he is not just a prophet come from God. He is not just a social revolutionary and not the leader of a new religious cult that bursts onto the scene. He is the anointed one. He is the shoot that rose from the stump of Jesse, the true vine. He is the good shepherd who knows the name of his sheep. He is a leader better than Moses, a priest 
better than Aaron. He's a sacrifice better than that original Passover lamb. He is the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament. And he has the power and the authority over creation because he is the creator. He is not hiding any of this. He is making it as clear as it can be. All you have to do is read the first seven and a half chapters, eight and a half chapters of, of this gospel, Mark. And you can see it clearly. Jesus is clearly revealing himself as the son of God. But, second point, but in order to understand and to see the true identity of Jesus, that requires not observation, but a divine intervention. Did you hear that? In order for people to understand Jesus' true identity, to see him as the sinless Savior, to know him as the Son of God, and to follow him as a disciple, it requires not just observation, but a divine intervention. The religious leaders and the crowds that followed him, even his own disciples, saw all of that evidence, and yet they were still blinded to his true identity. And today we saw through the example of the two-step healing of the blind man. We're reminded today that in our natural condition, we are blind to the things of God. We're deaf and unable to really hear his voice. But when he applies his powerful touch, and when it's accompanied by faith, the scales can fall from our eyes and we can see. And that understanding, that sight, has never been the result of our keen observation. That, that understanding and that sight has always been the gift of God. So then, our ability to see and trust Jesus is truly a gift of amazing grace. It is one that should daily lead us to thanksgiving and to a life of worship because God in his mercy opened our blind eyes to see and made our dead hearts beat new again. And in our efforts also to give a reason for the hope that we have within us, in our efforts to share our faith with our family and friends and loved ones, this should lift a burden from us. We are simply messengers so many of my, my, my brothers and sisters in the Lord feel an incredible sense of, of responsibility and a burden when talking with someone as though their understanding of the gospel is, is fully and totally dependent on the presentation or on the messenger. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. The ability to see and understand Jesus for who he is is the result of divine intervention. God in his mercy uses the message of the gospel to bring that to reality in people's hearts. But we are just messengers. The power to open eyes is not ours but God's. And that frees us from a burden but also will simultaneously drive us to a dependent prayer life. Because we need the movement of God on our efforts if we are ever to see our friends and our loved ones find the joy in Christ that we have found. Maybe you're listening this morning and you're someone, you've been intrigued by the stories of Jesus. You've been researching and pondering the identity of this man and, if, and you find yourself staring at a fuzzy, indistinct picture. You can kind of see what Jesus is and what he's about. You kind of hear what he's saying. But it's just fuzzy. And you're finding yourself sitting at home. And all of a sudden the image is getting clearer and clearer. Like, the, like that iron mask they make you wear at the, uh, the eye doctors. You know, is it number one or number two? Number one, number two. All of a sudden everything's clicking into place. And the image in front of you is getting clearer and clearer. And you're seeing what I'm saying today. That Jesus isn't just a moral teacher and a good prophet. He is the promised son of God. The anointed Messiah of the Old Testament. Come to seek and to save the lost. To inaugurate this new kingdom. To provide forgiveness and healing and salvation to all who would believe. And if that's you today and that picture is closing in and you're seeing it with focus and clarity now. Please know that that ability is a gift of God's grace and is evidence that he is drawing himself, drawing you 
to himself. The worst thing you could do today would be to harden your heart and turn away from that drawing. The best thing, the most life-giving and joy-inspiring thing you could do would be to turn away from your former pursuits and yield yourself to that Savior who's coming into view. Repent and turn to him in faith and be saved today. The message of Mark chapter 8, what he's trying to tell us here today, is that for us to know and see Jesus for who he is, required a work of divine intervention. And the mechanism that he uses, the tool that he uses to bring that awareness, most often, is the message of the gospel. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel that Paul preached of first importance. It is the gospel that has sustained the church for thousands of years. It is the gospel that this church stands on to this day. And it is the gospel that I have committed my life to preach. Have you trusted in that gospel? Has that message changed your heart? And if so, that was a gift of God's grace. Let it drive a life of worship. If not, why not today? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for all that you are doing in our lives and through the study of the scriptures. And we thank you that the word of God is powerful. That it's precise. God, that you know our needs and you meet our needs and you speak to us through the pages of the scriptures to soften our hearts and to shape our minds and our understanding, to conform us into the image of your Son. Lord, I, I pray, God, that we would be a people who revel in the gift of grace, the gift of illumination, the fact that you revealed yourself to us. I pray that in our evangelistic efforts, that our burdens would be lifted, that we would be messengers with great joy and passion, but ultimately we would be dependent on prayer so that you, my God, open the hearts and minds and lives of our friends and loved ones. I pray for those who are watching today who have never trusted you, that you would begin to bring their picture of you into focus, that they would see you, the good shepherd of Israel calling to the lost sheep, the good shepherd who lays down his life, the good shepherd who knows their names, knows their individual needs, knows the details of their lives, calling to them. God, I pray that in this moment, through the power of the Spirit, you would bring repentance and faith to their hearts. And I pray for our church family that we would ever be a congregation rooted in and built upon that message of the gospel. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Lord, I pray for uh, an understanding and a willingness to follow you on your path to glory even when that path leads through suffering. Continue to sustain our church through this pandemic and strengthen us, unify us, and build us up. And Lord, we look forward to the day we can be together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, Newtown Road and other friends from afar for joining in with us today. It is, as always, it is a joy and a privilege, a great honor to be able to teach you the Bible these last weeks. Uh, I pray for the day when we're not just gathering online like this, but are able to meet face to face. We ask that you would continue to pray for our elders and our staff as we work hard to come up with some good plans that are reasonable and appropriate and that are protective of the health of our congregation and the community. Uh, as of right now during this phase one, no changes to our current schedule. Um, hopefully within the next week to two weeks, we'll have some kind of uh, phased plan that will help us get back to a more or normal meeting schedule. That is our effort. That's our goal. We're working towards that right now. We ask for your patience in that and also your prayer support. And until then, continue to do what you've been doing. Continue to love God deeply, to give sacrificially, to love one another within the congregation as good brothers and sisters in the Lord. And let's continue to find ways to reach into the community and show the hope that we have in Jesus, even in the face of a pandemic. Newtown Road, I cannot wait to see you again. I love you guys, and I miss you, and I've had just about enough of this pandemic. But until we meet again, please know that I'm praying for you. Our elders and our staff are praying for you. We are asking God to sustain you and to uh, strengthen you through all of this. I will see you when we see you. And until then, guys, I love you, Newtown Road. 